Welcome, 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 welcome. This is the future of now. And if somebody does say it's already here, tell them they are absolutely wrong because we're helping to make the future and we all want to make it a better one for all of us. I am so delighted to be here today because we're talking about a topic that relates to the future of now and the title of this series. We're talking about futurists, futurology, futurism. Let me give you a little intro here and then I will have my four esteemed futurist guests. This is so exciting today. And by the way, the gentleman who introduced us on the roll-in intro is the voice of Ryan Treasure, the VP of, I call him VP of everything at Voice America World Talk Radio, and he did the intro for me, and he's our live engineer right now, so we've got Ryan twice, and we're very happy. Thank you, Ryan. So here we go. Futurists are people who attempt to predict the future. They could be authors, consultants, thinkers, organizational leaders, and others who engage in interdisciplinary systems thinking to advise private and public organizations, yes, they are involved in business, on diverse global trends, possible scenarios, the key word is possible, emerging market opportunities, and risk management. That's the business side. Futurists, what motivates them? They're motivated by change. Aha, okay. Not merely content to describe or forecast, they want to have an active role in world transformation. I had just read this last night and I thought it was very interesting and we'll find out if this is true true with my four expert guests. Futurology is concerned with three P's and one W. Okay, listen up. The P's are possible, probable, and preferable relating to futures. And the W is wild cards. Anybody like to play cards? Wild cards, which are low probability, but high impact events. In the book, The Left Hand of Darkness, Ursula K. Le Guin distinguished futurology, which is a business of profits, clairvoyance, and futurists from novelists whose business is lying. I think she was right. We're going to ask futurists Mike Bechtel, Frank Diana, Tom Raftery, and Alexandra Whittington for their take on this topic today, the future of futurist futurology and crystal ball technology, if we dare to go there. I am Bonnie D. Graham. Happy to be here. Actually, quite thrilled. Let's go around the table. Uh, Mike Bechtel, happy to have you here. I'm going to put you on speaker view. And Mike, would you please introduce yourself briefly and tell us why are you here? What is this so important? Go ahead. Absolutely, Bonnie. And thank you for having me. So, uh, a little about me, I, before I was a future in the past, uh, was an inventor and uh, worked in emerging technology R&D, trying to, you know, put together propeller headed inventions that could solve today's problems with tomorrow's technology. And it was all very exciting. But what you started to learn was that, you know, a, a, a scant percentage of all the stuff you dream becomes stuff you build. And, and a smaller still percentage becomes stuff that you can, you can sell and, and, and make a lasting impact with. And so I said, well, how can I move the needle a, a little further, a little faster? And, and then I became an investor. And, and as a venture capitalist and a VC, I sat on the proverbial other side of the table, which is to say I was receiving pitch after pitch from these, these harebrained inventors like my younger self. And I started to get an appreciation that the, the profit motive, the business integration, all that boardroom relevance stuff was the rocket fuel that inventors needed to, to make the mark they aspire to. And so having sat on both sides of that table, I sat back and I said, man, I had a good fortune to do some pretty neat stuff, but you know, it'd be even cooler taking the long view. And, and so as a futurist, what gets me fired up every day is pulling back from the headlines and, and looking at uh, looking at the Eternals, good old Henry David Thoreau said, read not the times, read the eternities. Well, uh, as a futurist, uh, I, I love, and I'm sure my colleagues love the, the breather, right? From, from the daily uh, outrage and, and the opportunity to see patterns in the noise and, and know that whether or not it's all going to be okay or not, uh, there's a story beyond the story and a story beyond that. Mike Bechtel, I should have had you pre-record that intro because I could have used it for the topic opener. Thank you very much. <laughs> the noise, the outrage, the breather. Very interesting. And thank you for the thorough quote. Let's go around the table. Tom Raftery, great to see you back. You were on a show with me recently, as was Mike. Tom, I'm going to say in case there might be 4.9 people around the world who don't remember you, shame on them. Why don't you introduce yourself to them? Go ahead. I have to follow Mike. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> I love you. Love Hi. you back, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie, for having me on. Uh, yeah, for people who don't know, my name is Tom Raftery. Um, I'm 
an Irish guy living in the south of Spain, loving it. Uh, I work for SAP, where my job title is Global VP, Futurist and Innovation Evangelist. Um, I, uh, I, I've, I've been kind of as a, a futurist for, you know, you know, since I was in college, basically. Uh, I, I'm a biologist by training in college, but only because I'm very ADD. And Ooh. being very ADD, I always, I'm distracted and I'm always looking for the new and the shiny things always. So that's why I got into science because it was exciting. There was always something new to learn. Uh, and then subsequently I got distracted from biology into technology because I got distracted because it's new and shiny. And so I, I've chased down technology and it's great. And I'm having loads of fun at it and still am because it's always new and shiny. And of course, that's what keeps me going. It's learning new stuff, seeing new things, scanning the headlines, as Mike rightly said. And, and stepping back and looking and then seeing those trends that are emerging and going, ah, so that's where it's all going. And that's, that's how I got into being a futurist. That's the kind of thing I love doing. I'm, I am a news junkie. I'm, I'm constantly devouring information. And yeah, to, to Mike's point, then looking, at, looking through all that information, seeing the trend lines, seeing where things were, where they are, and, you know, predicting forward, well, Obviously, it's all going to go that direction, isn't it? You know, so that's that's why I like being a futurist. And, you know, that's why I'm excited to be on the show today to talk about that stuff with, you know, people who do the same kind of thing. Thank you, Tom. I learned something new about you every time. I have to tell all of you so far, listening to Mike and Tom, it dawned on me that moms are futurists because aren't we always saying, to, aren't moms and dads saying to their kids, one day you'll be sorry if you keep doing that. One, one day, Mike, I was saying moms and dads are futurists. They say to their kids, one day you'll be sorry if you don't stop doing that. Or if you do that, never mind. We'll leave that one alone. But seriously, we're predicting <laughs> patterns for our children in the future. So if you don't go to college or if you don't take, or if you take that job or if you date that girl or that boy, yeah, there we are. So moms and dads are futurists. I just decided that. Frank, Diana, I have to tell our listeners, Frank has been on so many of my radio shows for years and years and years. And here we are on Zoom today. And it's the first time we are meeting, quote unquote, in virtual person. I like that virtual person. So Frank, Diana, welcome. So happy to have you here. Actually honored on your first Zoom show with me in 2020. And Frank, why don't you introduce yourself in case there are 2.3 people in the world who don't remember you. Shame on them. Go ahead, Frank. Oh, Bonnie, it's a pleasure to be back and actually a pleasure to actually see you, uh, as you as you just mentioned. <laughs> uh, so Frank Diana, as uh, your listeners might know, I'm with Tata Consultancy Services and I am a futurist, uh, spending most of my time talking to the world about where I think the, the world is heading. Um, but interestingly, in my story, I, I was never considered a futurist, nor did I ever focus there. As people might look at my background, I've been an executive in a number of different businesses and had that, that pragmatic view of what business is all about, but always seemed to have this ability to think strategically and to look at the bigger picture and to connect a series of dots. And I think it was about 2009, 2010, when I started to get really concerned at what I was seeing in that I just felt like we were heading towards a pretty transformative period in history. Uh, and I started to think about what I could do to help in that discussion, that dialogue, create some awareness, education, if you will. And uh, could I use those strengths in terms of connecting dots in ways that might help help society at some level? And that's when I started focusing there. I think it was 2010, um, and then the world started calling me a futurist. So you kind of I kind of backed into that that role. But it energizes me in that I think the world today needs awareness, education, dialogue. In these areas, I think the world is moving towards a very, very different place. Um, if anybody follows my work, they'll, they'll know I think we're heading toward a tipping point, actually, as humans. Uh, and so what do we need to do as futurists to help the world absorb that and deal with it constructively, if you will? Thank you, Frank. I love that one day they started calling you a futurist. Is it fun being a futurist, Frank, Diana? I really enjoy it, uh, both in terms of just how much you can educate your own self in so many different domains. I think that's the big thing with futurists. You have to really have a grasp of so many different things. It's not just science and technology, it's politics and, and the economy and society. It's just so many different things intersecting. Moving targets, moving along, right? That future, it's, it's here. I like to say the future 
is when I'm going to end the next sentence and then bingo, it's already gone, right? It's, it's yeah. here and then it's gone. Alexandra Whittington, I have to thank Frank Diana for introducing you to us. You and I met about eight minutes before the show went live. So happy to have you here. And you bring a very different perspective to futurist, futurism, futurology. So Alexandra, please introduce yourself to all of us and we're delighted you're here. Go ahead. I think you're muted. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Go. I That's hit okay. the button on my, my on my uh, cable here. We're good. Um, I'm Alexandra Whittington from Houston, Texas. I'm a futurist, and I'm delighted to be with this panel. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually, I like you said, Bonnie. I do come to future studies from a really different perspective. I think I'm one of the few people on Earth <laughs> who actually came to it through college classes. I took a future studies course as an undergrad, studying anthropology. And um, I really come to the study of the future from that anthropological perspective, right? We are a species on this planet, basically just trying to survive and make our way forward. We're constantly evolving and we're making new technologies, coming up with new cultural patterns to get us there. So that's the stuff I'm really interested in is social change. Um, I was actually glad to hear you mention motherhood, Bonnie, because that's <laughs> a big theme in my work. I do a lot of research around the future of families, the future of children, women's futures, and I'm really interested in social futures as far as, uh, you know, where are we going as a society? And not so much, you know, about the technology, but how do we wrap ourselves around that as people, you know, in terms of our language, our practices and behaviors. So that's what I get really excited about, the family as the microcosm of society and looking at how that looks, you know, going forward. Thank you, Alexandra. I'm not going to let you go quite yet. I have two questions for you. Number one, there's a lovely cat behind you on the cr credenza behind yes. you, and we're all commenting in the chat. <laughs> what is the cat's name, and is is the cat part of your future studies? I have to ask. And uh, number two, tell us a bit about the program you're in at the university. That's what I want to know about. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, that's Ginger, my cat. She never does this. I have two cats, and they're going insane right now, so there's something about this panel that they really like. Uh, so pardon the, the pet activity. Um, and, you know, I guess, you know, my whole family is involved in my futures activity. I have two kids and my, my kids think it's really cool that I'm a futurist. I've been a guest speaker <laughs> in, uh, in their classes in elementary and middle school. And, it, you know, kids are the best futurists. So I, I engage the whole family as much as I can, even the cats. Uh, so um, I do teach, though I work with young people all the time at the University of Houston, where I give undergraduate courses about future studies. And it's a really great situation to be in, honestly, because I get to interact with people from a bunch of majors, a bunch of backgrounds that come with a certain perspective that we can sort of layer on that futurist approach to, and it, it benefits them in a lot of ways. Thank you very much. It's such a delight to have you on the panel, Alexandra. Welcome. I know everybody else and you're our newcomer, so great. Thank you all for your bios and the enthusiasm. I love it. Now it's time for the quotes. I've asked my panelists, in case our listeners happen to be new to the show, I asked my panelists in advance to send me a movie or a song quote that has absolutely nothing to do with the topic, and then they're going to explain in their own words why they picked it and what it has to do with our topic today, which is the future of futurists. That's the pared down version of the topic. So Mike, Bechtel has sent us a quote from The Buggles, uh, an English new wave band formed in London in 1977. That was a whole other ridiculous time in the history of humanity, 1977, by singer and bassist Trevor Horn and keyboardist Jeffrey Downs, best known for their debut single. And here's the quote, video killed the radio star, which topped the UK singles chart and reached number one in 15 other countries. They broke up eventually and they do occasional get backs together for their music. So video killed the radio star. I feel threatened. Mike Bechtel, tell me, what does this have to do? <laughs> that presupposes that I think I'm a radio star. I don't know if I dare to go there far. Mike, what does this have to do with our topic? Go ahead. This show took a dark turn it heading did. into Halloween. It um, no, the, here, here's why I chose this one. Um, in it, you know, that, that song was either the first or maybe second video played on the then revolutionary startup MTV. And within the course of about 18 months, it turned from a uh, conjecture to a bit of a prophecy because a whole era of soft rock crooners like Christopher Cross, mm. right? good to listen to, by uh, Mr. Cross's admission, maybe not as, as good to look at, <laughs> went away 
in favor of slick, highly produced cover model performers like Madonna or yep. Michael Jackson or whatnot. Yep. And the reason I bring it up for futurism is circa 1979, I'm sure the A&R men were running around looking for the next Christopher Cross, right? Because they were worried about incrementalism, linear change, beating the enemy, beating the competitor. And then some business that had no business being in their business put them out of business. And so as, as a futurist, <laughs> I'm fascinated with this idea of discontinuities, of uh, these wild cards you mentioned at the opening, Bonnie, yes. these black swans that, that show up and to linear thinkers, you know, you, you never saw it coming. Well, we never could have prepared for that. But I'd like to think that if, uh, if, if that record label had a futurist on board, uh, they, they might have seen that one coming. And we might still have records. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bingo. I'll tell you, you a quick story. Uh, I was a collector of 45 RPM records back in the day. Nobody say a word. Frank might remember that day. I don't know if anybody else is old enough to. Frank, forgive me for that. But hey, friends are friends. And uh, I had a whole collection and I would watch American Bandstand, yes, and other shows. And the, the singers would be on the show. And sometimes I didn't want to see them performing because I wanted to imagine what the person looked like who was singing. Okay. In my mind, uh, they looked a certain way. They, they acted a certain way. They crooned a certain way, if you will. And then music videos came and now not was i not was i just seeing the person who was singing or the group i was seeing the producer's imagination of the entire scene the song was about and i got annoyed because i said wait a minute the song is how i want to see it want to feel it want to think of i don't want them to show me the girl walks in here and the car pulls up there and the store opens here and the mother says this i didn't want them to tell me how to imagine the songs i wanted to think and dream and make the songs resonate with me. They took away my ability. So I don't watch music videos. There you go. I just a little sidebar kids, but I had to share that. So many things are percolating up for goodness sake. Let's go to the next quote from Tom Raftery and Thomas picked a quote from a 1986 song by Tim Buck, T-I-M-B-U-K-3, the opening track from their debut album titled Greetings from Tim Buck 3. How interesting. It was released as the album's first single in 1986. And uh, I'm going to read the quote and then I'm going to give a sidebar here, Tom. So give me a second here. The future is so bright, I got to wear shades. This was something said by Pat McDonald, who was one of Tim Buck 3, by his wife about it's so bright, I have to wear sunglasses. And he just took it in and, uh, if you will, um, commercialize it into I got to wear shades, the original line with sunglasses but everybody thought it was about the bright future and in fact he was talking about impending nuclear holocaust and and the, the visual fallout from that about the shades but we're just going to see what tom raftery has to say about what does this quote mean to you tom talk to me sure um i'm not going for the nuclear option on, on this one i'm afraid Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no it's uh it it, it, it speaks to uh uh I don't know what you call it, a, a character flaw or, or a part of my personality, but I'm very much an optimist. And I think actually that's something that as futurists, you have to be. Uh, so I, I'm very much the, the glass half full person. Uh, when, I'm, when I am looking at where things are going, I tend, to, uh, I tend to see positive things. And I think that's because the arc of the future nearly always tends towards a positive. If you look over the last, uh, you know, one, 200 years worth of data, the, the world keeps getting better and better and better all the time. I mean, if you look at things like uh, rates of, of literacy, if you look at uh, child mortality, if you look at uh, poverty, if you look at uh, education, all the data for all the main key indicators of quality of life are tending in the right direction. They're all getting better and better and better over time. So the world is getting better every single day. Now, it's it's one of these kind of sawtooth patterns, you know, it's kind of two steps forward and one step back in, in some of these instances. But in general, in general, things are getting better and better and better all the time. And it's, it's, it's another reason I love being a futurist. Thank you very much. Wonderful quote. We appreciate the optimism and it is not a character flaw, Tom Raftery. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Does everybody raise or do you, do you think character flaw is optimism? Anybody, anybody agree with Tom? It's they disagree with Tom. I disagree with him. I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's a positive. It's a character characteristic. 
There you go, Tom. We're admiring you because you're an optimist. Thank okay, you. let's go on now. Frank Diana has sent me his go-to quote. Every time I ask Frank for a song for song or movie quote, he says, Bonnie, you know I only have one quote about the future, and it's from John Legend. So I said, okay, Frank, we'll use that one again. It's John Legend's quote, a lyrics from the song, "You're If You're Out There. It's the second single from John Legend's album, Evolver, which features, and I don't know how to pronounce this, the Agape or the Agape Choir. Frank, do you know how to pronounce that word? No, no, A-G-A-P-E. The song was released digitally ah, in 2008. That goes back a couple of years, inspired by Barack Obama's presidential campaign, and it was posted as a free download on the presidential campaign website. The song also alludes to Gandhi's quote, and I'll get to that in a minute. Here is the line. Let me just read the lyric. The first uh, stanza, if you will, Frank, and then I'll emphasize. If you hear this message wherever you stand, I'm calling every woman calling every man. We're the generation. We can't afford to wait. Here's the line. The future started yesterday and we're already late. I still love the quote, Frank. Talk to me. How did you, why do you keep on picking this future quote? I think I know. Go ahead, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, it's just a great song. Uh, and that being a really a big music fan, I, I like good songs. So it's a really good song. But lyrically, it's very impactful. And if you go back to what I mentioned in my bio, um, I just always felt that the urgency to act was lacking in my conversations around the globe in the last decade. Um, that's the one takeaway I've gotten is that folks just don't feel compelled to act. And so I just linked that to a lack of urgency. And so when he says things like the future started yesterday and we're already late, it speaks to that. It talks to the fact that there's just a lack of that focus on where things are going. And the lyrics talk about our ability to shape this future if we invest in doing so. And I think that's the big takeaway for me is I am an optimist, um, but there's always been dual paths to, um, to history. One is always in the positive direction, the other is destructive. And we can see a destructive path here if, if you really look closely. And so how do we as, as a society come together to manage this path forward in very constructive ways? And I just think that quote says it perfectly. It's lovely. It's lovely. And we're getting comments here in the chat. Everybody says it's super cool and it's really cool. And yeah. So, hey, I could see the chat and I, I love the commentary here. Let's go to Alexandra. She has sent us a quote from this is the first time the movie Groundhog Day has been on my show, if you can pardon that phrase, Alexandra. 1993 American fantasy comedy directed by Harold Ramis, written by Ramis and Danny Rubin, stars Bill Murray, Andy McDowell, Chris Elliott. Okay. Uh, Murray portrays Phil Connors, a cynical TV weatherman covering the annual Groundhog Day event in Puxatawney, Pennsylvania. We all know Puxatawney Phil. I think we do in this country. I'm not sure about Tom. Who becomes trapped in a time loop, forcing him to relive February 2nd over and over and over. The film is considered one of the greatest films of the 1990s, the whole damn decade, and one of the greatest comedy films of all time. It has impacted popular culture. And the term Groundhog Day, the movie title, became part of the English lexicon as a means to describe a monotonous, unpleasant, and repetitive situation, which is what AI and ML are trying to get rid of in, in workers' lives right? We're trying to get rid of the repetitive, the boring. I'm alluding to technology here. Here's the quote, Alexandra Speck. Well, what if there is no tomorrow? There wasn't one today. Alexandra, love the quote. Talk to me. Yeah, I thought that was a really fun quote. Um, you know, kind of building on the optimism theme. I think futurists also, at least me as a futurist, I kind of embrace absurdity, you know, and things that are just sort of off the wall. I think we have to, along with being optimistic, we kind of need to be comfortable with, um, you know, crazy ideas. And the idea that there, you know, wasn't one today, why would there be one tomorrow? I think that's just sort of a fun, um, absurd idea about the nature of time and about the nature of reality. And it gets you thinking about, um, you know, what is what is the future exactly? You know, with different cultures and different times over history have had different conceptions of what that means. We're really locked in this 24 hour, one after another serial concept of time. Uh, but, you know, maybe that's just one of the many uh, illusions of our current life. Uh, amen to that. <laughs> I think you speak the truth <laughs> of our current life. Let's move on. It is October, what, 21st, 2020? Uh, I have a radio show on Monday nights on a different channel, the Variety Channel here on Voice America, and it's called Read My Lips, Cool Conversations with Creatives. And I always give where we are in terms of the, the part, the day, the Monday of the year, how many Mondays in and how many days in. And then I give the number of days left to the end of the year. And I give it with a warning. And the warning is, okay, if you want something special to drink on New Year's Eve, 
We're only something like 70 days left. So find your <laughs> best local liquor store, wine store, whatever, or some concoction you're going to make or an online store and order it because the shelves will be emptied soon because we can't wait for the end of 2020. So I've been warning since March, people get your booze for New Year's <laughs> Eve. We're going to really want to celebrate since the middle of March. Excuse me. Thank you all. This is great. So let's go to, let's go to, now it's time for the serious part of the show. Are we going to get serious? Serious here? I'm not sure. I think we're having way too much fun. And that's what the conversation format is all about. So let's go to Mike Bechtel. And Mike, I'm going to pick your number one prediction, which actually is a quote. This is interesting. I'm going to read it. And then Mike, I'll put you on speaker view. And why don't you take just about two minutes and explain what it means in your own words, unpack it as we say on the news, or they say on the news, since I'm not a news person. And then I will go to a quote from Tom, I'm sorry, a prediction from Tom, a prediction from Frank, one from Alexandra. And we'll go around the table it's still early. Oh, by the way, you know what? I forgot something. It's time for me to tell you that we have a special sponsor on today's show. I want you all to say, Bonnie, tell us about the sponsor. Go ahead, everybody. Bonnie, tell us about, the, about sponsor. the sponsor. Tell us. Sponsor, <laughs> Thank you. Well, I have an exciting announcement. Our sponsor is monday.com. And the place I want you all to go to learn more about what I'm going to tell you is monday.com slash the word future, all in lowercase. So imagine developing one of the first apps ever in the app store. Well, we know that ship has sailed. Sounds like a once in a lifetime opportunity, but it's coming around again. Monday.com is an online platform that powers over 100,000 teams. That's teams, that's multiple people, their daily work. And they just launched a contest to build apps that will be included in the Monday.com marketplace launch. They're giving away prizes that I promise you will blow your mind. If we weren't the advertisers here, we would enter the contest ourselves. I used to be a programmer, not an app developer, but I could learn fast. Want to be one of the the first in the Monday apps marketplace. Well, you can start building today. And as I told you, it's monday.com slash future. Let me tell you a little bit more about the, about the platform. It's a work OS that powers teams to run processes, projects, and build common workflows in one digital workplace. It's an easy to use, flexible, and visual team platform for teamwork, beautifully designed to manage any team, any organization, or any process online. It's a platform for teams also of any size in any industry that improves your coordination and puts departments together, business units together, enables teams to move faster and reach their goals easier. And you can customize it to fit your existing specific workflow. So you can plan, manage, and track everything your team needs in one centralized place. And that's what we all need because we know everybody is working remotely. Those of us who've been re re working remotely for years probably figured it out by now. People who were furloughed to work remotely in the past, what, eight months, six months, seven months, this may be new and teams need to coordinate. So let me give you the challenge. The Monday Apps Challenge is bringing developers around the world together to compete, to build apps that can improve the way teams work together on monday.com. That's the focus. Whether it's to help marketing, construction, sales, software developers, or any other industry, they're looking for impactful, out-of-the-box, simply amazing apps to include and even feature in their upcoming apps marketplace. I want you to go to monday.com slash future, lowercase f-u-t-u-r-e. That's the code for my show. And rumor has it that the number one prize is a car that starts with the letter T, and ends with the letter A. I'll let you all figure it out. Wouldn't that be great to build an app and get that car in your driveway or let your teenage son or daughter drive it? What can I say? Now it's time to go to our prediction. So let's go to Mike Bechtel. And Mike's first prediction is futurism will be recognized by businesses as a critical strategic discipline as winning business models will be less about emulating best practices and more about creating next practices. Mike, two minutes, talk to me. Well, Bonnie, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't really uh, show my colors during my intro, but I, I, I work as a, a futurist with Deloitte, the okay. management consultancy. And it, with Deloitte, I have the privilege of sitting in a lot of, you know, with a lot of clients and a lot of boardrooms and, and, and getting a taste of what people are excited about and what people are worried about. And the, the idea behind this quote, th this idea of this, this, this graduation from companies asking each other, hey, what's best, to companies asking each other, hey, what, what's next? I think some of the seeds of it were well captured in a, uh, a book around 2014 written by uh, a curious but undeniably sharp cat named Peter Thiel, okay, venture capitalist, startup founder, uh, political activist. But 
his book was called Zero to One. And in the subtitle, it's one of these, you know, like um, Dr. Strangelove, you know, notes on startups or how to build the future. And <laughs> he talked about this idea that, that if you're a startup and you're going to build a business, you don't want to build a business that competes, right? You don't want to build the next deli in town because the insight that he had was that competition is a recipe for a bad time, right? You're going to be cats in a bag in a fight to the bottom competing for scarce money and margin. And so his insight, very provocative, was you want to create something that's brand honking new, that's 10x better than anything that came before it, and ah, gasp, that's a monopoly. Mm -hmm. Now, we've seen in the news this week, you know, how's yep. that working out for, for some mm. large household name companies, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you got to be careful about the use of the M word. Yep. But here's where I'm going with this. Big companies are starting to catch the drift, right? Incumbents are starting to get this sense that you know, we, we always say the electric light didn't come from the continuous improvement of the light bulb, right? Or in Harari. Um, they're recognizing that they need to invest in not just uh, bettering their existing cash cows, their oak trees, but uh, starting to look at acorns, right? And, and look at them not as distractions, but as these things that when they're sent up a hockey stick, right? When it's an exponential acorn, look out, you'll poke your eye out. Right. And so as a futurist, uh, I believe, and I'm beginning to see that business strategy, right? Strategy consulting, if you will, strategy as a, as a corporate function, a chief strategy officer, he's going to have more skills like those taught by Alexandra, right? Or those, those practiced by Frank or, or Tom, uh, and, and less of your traditional spreadsheets and, you know, add 10% and call it a day. Uh, so, so I believe futurism is the new business strategy. Thank you very much. I like that very much. Applies to our business listeners around the world. We are on the business channel. Tom Raftery, prediction number one, you say, as a futurist, I, this is Tom speaking, I use more and more technology to identify what trends are happening in the world. And he quotes Clay Shirky. There is no such thing as information overload. There is only filter failure. I never heard that before. Tom, take two minutes. Tell us what this all means, please. Sure. Um, so, to, to your point, uh, Clay Shirky, I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard of him. He is a professor of journalism out of NYU, I think it is, uh, and he's written several books. And uh, this is a quote that he had in one of his books from, I want to say, around 2006, that kind of ballpark. Uh, I, I'm not sure if he originated the quote, but he certainly had the, the, the quote in the book. And it was one that struck me at the time because I felt it was very true and it continues to hold true. Um, I did say earlier on that uh, I am a news junkie. I, mm -hmm. you know, consume enormous amounts of information. I, sp I suspect the other panelists are as well. It's, you know, part and parcel of the job. And, you know, I, I for example, I, I follow more than 20,000 people on Twitter. Well, 20,000 accounts on Twitter, I should say. And they're not all necessarily people. But, um, and, and, you know, people ask, how do you follow that many people? Because, you know, if you're only following, you know, 100 people on Twitter, you, you try and follow every single thing they say and try and keep up with what they're saying. But if you get to the scale of 20,000 people that you're following, obviously you can't manage that. So you have to have tools in place to manage that. And there are lots of good tools out there. And of course, it's not just I consume information from all kinds of places, but so not just Twitter, but, you know, that's just an example. There are tools in place for the likes of Twitter, for example, that can allow you to follow that many accounts and see a, the, the important nuggets from that fire hose of information that comes from those 20,000 accounts. Uh, and there, there are similar tools for all the other sources of information available out there as well. Uh, lots of them. And because news is happening or the reporting of news is happening faster and faster and faster and we we are we are getting more sources of news all the time and it, it's coming at us faster all the time you do need to have those filters in place to make sure you're not overloaded uh, and that's and and that's you know as a futurist it's important that you have really really good tools as well that the information you're getting through is really good otherwise you'll make bad predictions or bad assumptions so that that's where the quote comes or that's where the, the the idea comes from you know as a futurist i am constantly scanning news seeing what's happening and i do need to have a good tool set to make sure that i'm not overloaded thank you very interesting i hadn't heard that quote from clay shirky before i've heard some others so thank you tom frank diana 
Prediction number two. This is interesting. A lot of terms in here I want you to explain. Success in predictions will be challenged by uncertainty, by speed, and an overwhelming number of building blocks that are emerging and combining in ways that are impossible to foresee. I'm going to stop there. Frank, why don't you take about two and a half minutes, since everybody else has, and tell us what this all is about. I want to focus on the uncertainty and impossible to foresee, because that goes to the heart of what a futurist does. Go ahead, Frank. Anybody that follows my work knows I'm not a big believer in predictions um, because of the things I mentioned there, um, the sheer number of building blocks that exist in the world today and how they're combining. Um, it's just very hard to see those combinations. It, it was actually first, I saw that in a book titled The Second Machine Age from Andrew McAfee um, at, at MIT. And he talked about the, the building blocks that exist in, in our world today and the way they combine, it, it's just almost impossible to predict them. So I focus more on rehearsing the future as opposed to attempting to predict it, um, accepting mm. that the, the, the future is about possible paths um, and looking at those paths and trying to understand where they might go and consistently and constantly redoing that view, right? So it's it might be going here one day, but something emerges like a pandemic and completely shifts that, that view. So it's an acceptance in my mind that prediction is likely impossible, um, but rehearsing is something that everybody needs to do. And, and I'll go back to the notion that Mike brought up about strategy and how leaders should think about strategy. Um, a, a strategy is not a three to five year plan anymore. It just can't be. I mean, it's a highly iterative process that looks at these things and simulation technologies and other technologies will help us with that. But it's consistent, constant and iterative and anything else is just going to fall short. Thank you very much. The good, the bad, and more in good and bad in there. But that's a reality check on what it's like to be a futurist. Thank you. You Do you have nerves of steel, Frank, Diana, when you say you're, you're looking to the future, you don't like to predict, but things turn out not the way you thought they would? Is there any, OMG, I'm not going to sleep tonight. I feel so bad. I, I thought something else was, is there any, do you take it personally, Frank? Let me just ask you that. Do you take it personally? Is something you, you futurize? Oh, I made up a new verb. Something you futurize is, doesn't work out, Frank, just quickly. What do you think? Well, I'll answer, but I'm actually interested in what everybody else thinks. I will go around the table. Yeah. What, what's your thought? Um, no. Uh, first of all, again, accepting that I don't think I can predict this stuff, but helping people envision where these things might go um, is much more uh, gratifying for me than thinking that I was right. I, I just don't think there's any point in trying to think you're right. It's really helping folks see a path or potential paths. So we're going back to mom. The old, I told you so. Maybe they were right. I don't know. <laughs> Let's go around the table. Mike, I'm just going to leave it on speaker view. Mike Bechtel, you're up. Talk to me. Do you take this personally if something doesn't pan out? No, I, I think I, I have a close colleague who likes to say that he, he thinks prediction is a, is a mugs game. And it's always stuck with me because I, I think calling the shot is less important than, than getting on base, if you will, like to use a baseball analogy, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's impressive that Babe Ruth called it, but it didn't score any more runs on account of it. And I, I think that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with Frank that it, it, it's about projections, right? It, future's not transparent. It, I, I, we like to say it's translucent. It's mm. shapes and shadows. And even the shapes and shadows are useful. They're merely very useful. Um, and so when people go, ha ha, if you didn't get the fine <laughs> details right, it's like, well, I, I, I still saved or made you some scratch. <laughs> Tom Raftree, what do you think? You're up. Take it personally. I'm afraid I'm going to have to violently agree with Frank and Mike. <laughs> um, you know, it's I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it is that. I mean, you, you, you don't say, well, on the 10th of October 2025, this is going to happen. It's nothing like that. You're, you're talking about directions things are going in. And the, the, the easy thing to do is to say where things are going. The harder thing to do is to say when it's going to happen. And you, it's almost impossible to get that right. But it's a lot easier to say, well, things are going in this direction and this is going to happen. But I'm not going to tell you when, because I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Alexandra, do you take it personally? Not at all. You know, I think with predictions, people are really hung up on the idea of it being accurate predictions. And I, in this regard, I enjoy being wrong. You know, I think that it's more important to be perceptive than to be 
accurate. And um, I mean, just sort of tongue in cheek, if it's accuracy and dates you want, you should consult an astrologer because they can provide you with, <laughs> you know, computa co you know, computations about when things will happen. But that's not what we do. We, we provide, I like that, you know, translucent. We provide the outline, the shape. It's a blurry picture that comes into view. But um, I, I think I've actually learned to embrace the word prediction because it actually, all it means is saying it first. And I think that being unafraid to say it first is the hallmark of a futurist and just say, you know, I'm going to say this, it might be wrong, but what's not wrong is the chain of thought and the, and the experimental like mind models that can emerge from these kinds of stories. Interesting. And you know what, um, a psychic or whoever you pay to read the tea leaves, they're never going to apologize if they're wrong. <laughs> you pay them and you walk out and you own their, their prediction, whatever it is. And you come back and say, wait a minute, I didn't marry the blonde guy. I married the brunette. I don't know. Anyway, I, did, I didn't, didn't buy that car and I didn't go to, I, I, I had somebody who's a, uh, what did they, they called them an intuitive, where I come from in New York. She was an intuitive and she predicted I would work for a woman's magazine at some point. And I don't, I can't find any part of that prediction for me that ever made any sense at We're all. Still fine. <laughs> I'm on my seventh career. Let's give it a rest, okay? <laughs> Alexandra, I'm looking at your prediction number one. We're going to get into some heavy stuff here with Alexandra. She says, BCI, I will translate brain computer interface. Companies such as Neuralink by Elon Musk are bringing neurotech to the market. This could change. Ah, she's talking to all of you. How futurist research interact and experience the future. Why don't you unpack this one, please, Alexandra? Sure. So this is a really cutting edge technology that a lot of people are talking about. Um, Elon Musk is talking about testing this on a human subject, excuse me, <clears throat> sometime this year. Um, and what it is basically is it can involve brain implants or even external wearables that detect brainwave activity. And we're talking about, you know, hacking the mind, uploading the brain, uploading something to your brain in place of learning. Um, and actually, I think this came up a little earlier. Um, it's kind of mystical, uh, sort of like telepathic communication could be possible. So, you know, in a future panel with me, Mike, you know, Frank and Diana, we could be sitting here just, you know, sharing our thoughts, you know, without even speaking. Speaking. That would be a step above Zoom, right? I'm just wondering how future researchers and students just, you know, across all fields, not just futurists, but we may actually search the web by, for example, uh, by thinking what we want to research and then maybe write a paper by, you know, analyzing it in our mind and letting our brainwaves sort of dictate what comes out and then working from there. So um, I think a lot of people could conceivably be working through, um, you know, tapping into their their consciousness um, and you can actually do like web searches, you know, communicate with your devices. It was actually meant to allow uh, disabled or paralyzed people to interact with computers and stuff. So that's the first part of it. But later on, it, it could become a common research tool. Thank you very much. Let's see if we can do a second round of predictions. We've got 12 minutes left till the end of the show. And I want to see if we can cover one more from each. So Mike Bechtel, prediction number three, futurists will increasingly embrace futuristic technologies themselves, machine learning, AR, VR, to turbocharge their ability to model, simulate, and convey possible futures. Mike, why don't you take about 90 seconds, if you can, force yeah, yourself. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, with <laughs> brevity on overdrive, um, you know, it, it, growing up in, in IT, 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 there's a blizzard of buzzwords and, new, you know, you're up to your eyeballs in newfangledness. But I'll tell you that at, at the end of the day, it is and always has been, you know, information, computation, interaction, right? Data, math, and, and IO. And, and I think, you know, on the sensing front, you know, it, it, Internet of Things, the idea of sensors everywhere, giving us information on everything, it, it, it helps create this idea of, we call it digital twins. Mm -hmm. That if you've, got, if you've got a sim city of a real city, uh, you can play with it and you can predict it and you can optimize it. And, and then there's simpler tech, crowdsourcing it at, at Deloitte. Uh, we've got a team of a hundred or so enthusiasts treasure hunting novelty all the time. And they're filling a, a system for us, not, not to say they're right or they're omniscient. It's just to say that like, huh, haven't heard of that before. Haven't heard of that before. So this idea of, of more reach with people or machines, um, it, it, it can be a beautiful accelerant. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Beautiful accelerant. Let's leave it at there. Thank you, Tom Raffrey. Prediction number three. I'm skipping around. Bill Gates said, and you quote, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 
10 years. He's probably absolutely right. The Apple Watch debuted in 2015. If I had told you, this is Tom talking, in 2006 and in 10 years, you'd have a watch that can do what? Tom, 90 seconds. What does this all mean? Well, you, you kind of explained it right there. <laughs> okay, it's, I thought it's, so. It's, it's, it's exactly that. It is, though. So, uh, we, we, we do. We, we kind of tend to, to Bill's point, you know, uh, overestimate what will happen in the next two years and underestimate what will happen in the next 10. Uh, the, the iPad debuted in 2010. I know I'm using Apple products, but, you know, uh, it, it's hard to believe that it, it it's only been out 10 years. The smart phones have been out now. The Android was launched in 2008, the iPhone in 2007, so 13, 12, 13 years. As I mentioned, the Apple Watch only came out in 2015, five years ago, you know, it, it's it's part of uh, smartwatches in general are, are part of people's lives now. And you've seen what's happened with those smartwatches in that very small length of time. The, the latest version of the Apple Watch now does blood oxygen measurements. You know, you, mm. they, they have built in ECGs. Uh, Apple, when they released the Apple Watch, they released an open source research tool called Research Kit, which enables researchers to enroll thousands, tens of thousands of people into medical studies, which were impossible to do in the past. And the, the, the amount of data they can get back, and it's data which is uh, objective, not subjective. One of the studies they did was studies of people who had Parkinson's, and it was a study of their gait, the kind of way they walk. And typically mm. before this was, before, before this happened, you would walk, if you had Parkinson's and you were a patient, you'd walk into your doctor's office and they'd measure your gait Object, or subjectively by eye on a scale of one to five. Uh, and if you went to a different doctor, you might get a different measurement, which could, you know, throw out your diagnosis. But if it's done with an Apple Watch measuring using the accelerometers, mm -hmm. measuring your gait, that is completely objective. And if you do this over thousands of people, suddenly you get yeah. much, much, much better data. And like I said, if I had said to you in, in 2006 mm -hmm. that in 10 years you'd have a watch which could measure your gait, which could do an, do an ECG, which could call a doctor if you fell down, these kind of things. You would say, Tom, you're smoking crack. How would that even work? And yet here we are. <laughs> yet here we are. I remember a, a dear friend of mine who was a tech novice, we'll call it curious, and figured things out on his own, got an, an early Apple Watch from his children for a gift. He had no blank and clue what to do with it. I think he gave it back. It was so early in the iteration of that technology, in the evolution, that there wasn't much you could do with it other than what do I do with it? And and I know people who sent back early iPhones because they didn't know, if, oh, I'll give it to my dad. I'll give it to my grandma. They just didn't know. My mom, who passed away at 100, had her, she was on the computer. We gave her a Mac and she didn't like the Apple system. So we gave her a PC and she liked Apple better. So we went back to the Mac. She was doing research online. She had a cell phone, which she charged most of the time. But what's interesting is her friends, her, her mostly her women, they were mostly widows by this point in their 90s when their kids gave them a laptop or a PC or a phone, they gave it back and they said, I'll pick up the phone and call my friends. What do I need this stuff for? But my, my mom was a technophile in her night. She used to listen to my radio shows online every Monday night. It was hard to believe in her 90s. We just set it up as a favorite and she clicked and she'd email me after and call me and say, I love the show. That was that was a real treat. Let's go to uh, Frank Diana, prediction number three. We're good on time. And then one more from Alexandra before we end. Prediction number three, organizations at all levels, Frank says, will embrace futurism for what it is. Frank, I'll let you finish that sentence and that thought, please. Go ahead. Yeah, I mentioned it earlier. It's not forecasts and three-year plans, but it really is finding ways to infuse foresight into uh, everything we do. And in, in doing so, we illuminate potential paths, right? So I think this whole notion of futurism is all about illuminating the paths. And I do think leaders around the world have to embrace this more aggressively. I think it just changes the whole way we think about futurists going forward. Um, and I, I go back to what something I think Tom said about better filters. I mean, all this mm -hmm. basically says that how we infuse foresight into these processes is critical data is at the heart of all that. Um, IoT gets to be a bigger player in that, in that it helps us sense these things sooner. Um, but it just, I, I just shifts the, I think, the view of futurism and futurists in the context of how leaders have thought about it in the past, at least I hope so. Thank you very much, Alexandra. I'm teeing up one of your predictions. Let's go to number four, mixed reality. The rise of VR and AR has allowed for a new world of mixed reality to emerge. And then you say, this is what I want you to focus on. This will change the way futurists and their clients interact 
with the future. You didn't say in the future, with the future. Very interested in this. Uh, why don't you take about two minutes and then we'll start to close up. Go ahead, Alexandra. Yeah, well, this is sort of building on what has been already said uh, on this panel, which is that, you know, we have these new technologies. And what I was looking at is how we can implement them to immerse our clients and immerse the public, you know, in the future, whether it's using VR or AR or, you know, some version of, you know, more experiential, interactive, and sort of, you know, personalized futures where you can actually experience something and learn from it. For example, VR has been used in a, co a couple of instances to train people in things like empathy and to help people with, you know, depression and various psychological problems. So, you know, there's a lot of untapped power and I'm not saying, you know, let's uh, brainwash our clients or something with VR, but maybe we can tap into different ways of perceiving the world, perceiving the future. And it's always such a challenge because the future is intangible. So these technologies may actually actually make it something people feel like they've touched and felt and immersed themselves in, therefore making it a more valuable, you know, business proposition. Thank you very much. Mike Bechtel, want to comment? I'll just, I just wanted to put a high five to Alexandra and, and an exclamation mark on it. it I, I feel like you can do a lot of thinking about this stuff, but sometimes what's needed is helping people feel it. And whether it's it's these rich AR VR texts that you talk about, Alexandra, like like here, throw these goggles on. That's that's what climate change looks like, or you know, that's what urbanization looks like, or or, or even just narrative in storytelling and and dare I say, speculative fiction. Um, you you got to act, activate the whole person and not just the the brain. Very interesting. Thank you all. I'm thinking about, I'm in a 55 plus community here in Durham, North Carolina, and I'm thinking that people who bought into this community are thinking, what would their future be like? What do they want to be doing in a year or two? Most of them are retired, but not everybody, including me, still working hard. But interesting, we are in a way, we need to be futurists in our own lives, right? How do you save for retirement? How do you plan to, in the pandemic, the future of families? Uh, everybody's grappling now with, will we all gather around a real or a virtual table at Thanksgiving? What about Christmas? What about Hanukkah? What do we do? In a way, we all are looking at the patterns, the safety, the, the economics, the social Socialization, the health risks. We're all trying to predict our own future right now. I am so appreciative to all of you for this. And I'm going to challenge you each to one 30 second prediction about the future of futurists. One 30 second prediction about what you do. Okay. Will we still need futurists, have futurists, respect futurists, invite futurists on radio shows by 2025. Mike Bechtel, 30 seconds, control yourself. Go ahead. I'm keeping you on gallery view so we can see everybody. Mike, go. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think I think there's going to be more more folks who come into this craft, but like Alexandra did, I, I think the university background is 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 going to be um, a bigger, not smaller part. And I and I think that's in part because it's going to be about the return of the Renaissance person, the polymath. I think what this group has shown is we all have different backgrounds, and it's the multiple lenses that make this go. And so um, I, I think futurism's here, and it's it's a multidisciplinary. You're a, you're you're Thank you very much. I'm tongue tied. Tom Raftery, 30 seconds less, 20 seconds, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a discipline that is going to grow in importance because we've seen over the last number of decades the way the future is condensing, the way things are happening faster and faster and faster. We've seen adoption curves of all kinds of technologies get steeper and steeper and steeper. And, you know, people need to know what the implications of that is. And so Therefore, the, the importance strategically of our craft to organizations is becoming more and more acute. Thank you. Frank Diana, 15 seconds. I'll take a different tact. I think we all need to be futurists, whether parents informing our children Love it. or leaders informing their organizations. It's all of us. Thank you. Alexandra, you get the last sentence and then I have to wrap. Yeah, I'm just going to make that plug again for education. I think it will become more integral to education from kindergarten through university and post post university you know i think it, it will be ingrained in the way that we learn um largely by consequence of events that people will be experiencing in their real lives thank you very much reality check everybody remember monday apps 
Challenge. Monday Apps Challenge is bringing developers around the world together to compete to build apps that can improve the way teams work together on monday.com. Whether it's to help any industry, marketing, construction, sales, software developers, any role, we're looking for impactful, out-of-the-box, amazing apps to include and feature in the upcoming monday.com apps marketplace. Go to monday.com slash future, lowercase, F-U-T-U-R-E, no caps in sight. Thank you to our sponsor, Mike Bechtel. Always a delight. I always think you're speaking in poetry for some reason when you talk. It's like we're writing, we're writing a book of prose poetry here when you speak. Uh, let's see, Tom Raftery, he, my, my listeners aren't viewers, but you always rock the hat. Thank you very much. Words of wisdom. Frank, Diana, finally we got to meet each other face to face. Such a pleasure. Light, love the sparkling white shirt. I want to know what, you, what your detergent you use. You're, you're so bright. You're jumping. The future is so bright. We do need shades. Alexandra Whittington, you brave person. You joined this panel. You knew nothing about me or only about <laughs> Frank. And you are here and you've rocked it. And Ginger, the cat, oh, she's gone. Tell Ginger, I said, I appreciate it. I've got 30 seconds to close. I want to thank you all. And Frank, thank you for introducing us to Alexandra. Let's hear it for Aaron Keller, my engineer extraordinaire. Thank you, Aaron. And let's hear it for Ryan Treasure, my other engineer extraordinaire, who's the co-producer of the show and the voice of the intro. I'm going to say to everybody, thanks for tuning in to Technology Revolution, the future of now. I'm Bonnie D. Graham. I'm going to be in the future, I think, as far as I know. No name change coming up. Remember the future of now. It didn't happen yet. If anybody said the future is here, tell them, tisk tisk. That was yesterday's future. We're all going to make today's future a better one. Everybody wave. Bye-bye.